Well, good morning again. It's pretty dark out there today. <laughs> well, speaking of children, when the disciples asked Jesus, Jesus, who is the, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus answered them by calling a, a small child over to them. And he said that we must become humble like little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the Christian life is so simple that a child can live it out. There is something teachable, there is something pure when it comes to the faith of the child that Jesus says we as adults can learn from. So in that sense, the Christian life is simple. It's not complicated. You don't have to be extremely intelligent to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're educated or un uneducated. It doesn't matter how old you are. We see that the abundant life in Jesus Christ is available to everyone who believes in him. Therefore, it's simple. But on the other hand, it can feel difficult. At times, it can feel difficult when we battle that same temptation again and again. It can feel difficult to trust God when we suffer. It can feel difficult or sometimes even intimidating when we try to read the Bible and there are some things in the Bible which can be hard for us to understand. You know, Peter even says this about some of Paul's teachings in 2 Peter 3. He says, Yeah, 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 some of Paul's teachings are hard to understand. So which is it? Is the Christian life simple? Or is the Christian life difficult? Well, that's what I want to look at this morning. So if you have a Bible, please turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, uh, beginning in verse 16. We also have translation today uh, into Russian. You can come see Sasha uh, to get connected to that. And we have the scripture for you on the screen uh, as well. But Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16, last week I, I touched on the topic of walking in the Spirit. Someone asked me uh, after the sermon if I could go a bit deeper on that topic. And so here we are today. Let's go to these verses that talk directly about what it means to walk in the Spirit. Chapter 5, chapter five beginning in verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So obviously we're jumping right into Galatians chapter 5 right here. Uh, but in this chapter, Paul is talking about our freedom in Christ. So we looked at this a lot the, the past couple weeks in Romans chapter 6. Christ sets us free from slavery to sin. We are dead to sin and alive to Christ thanks to what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But earlier in Galatians 5, Paul says, but hey, don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. So we see here in verse 16 uh, that by walking in the spirit, this is opposed to or against walking in the flesh. So what do we mean by these two terms? Well, let's go to the spirit first. So the Bible teaches us that there is one God and our one God exists in three persons. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's one God. There's not three gods. Rather, they are one God existing in three persons. They are all God. They are one in essence and one in substance. But at the same time, they are distinct from one another. What that means is Jesus is God, but Jesus is not the Holy Spirit or God the Father, or the Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit is not Jesus or God the Father. As I said, they are distinct in persons. They do different tasks, as we see in the Bible. But let's zoom in on the Holy Spirit since we are talking about
about walking in the Spirit. And first of all, let me say again that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's not some kind of mystical force, which is how sometimes people talk about the Holy Spirit. Rather, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit is a person. In the Bible, the Holy Spirit is referred to as He. So the Holy Spirit isn't some mystical force. He is a person. We often talk about having a relationship with God the Father. We talk about having a relationship with Jesus the Son. But we also have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He is a person. We see in the Bible that the Holy Spirit has emotions. He can be grieved. He has a will. So the Holy Spirit isn't a force like, like we see in Star Wars, let's say. Rather, the Holy Spirit is a person. But let's talk about the Holy Spirit as a person. You know, when we see God the Father in the Bible, or when you read about God the Father in the Bible, perhaps you imagine uh, this wise, older father, let's say, with a, with a beard, right? Maybe that's your, your image of God. And also in the Bible, we see Jesus as the Son of God. So maybe you picture Jesus as this younger, obedient responsible son. But then we get to the Holy Spirit. And some people think about the Holy Spirit like he is this wild and crazy uncle. Does anyone have an uncle like that who is a bit always unpredictable, an uncle who is a bit loud, this uncle who dances a little crazy, who maybe says something surprising? Right? That uncle is fun to have at the party, but he would be a nightmare to live in your home. But sometimes people talk about the Holy Spirit in this way, like this wild and crazy uncle of the family. But is that a fair picture of the Holy Spirit? You know, when we read the Bible, we see that the Holy Spirit teaches believers. He convicts believers of sin. He, he, he speaks to believers. He helps us make decisions. He helps us pray. The Holy Spirit empowers us he comforts us. He gives us gifts to, to benefit the church. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom. Jesus calls him our helper. Does that sound like a wild and crazy uncle to you? Ephesians 1 says that when we become believers, we receive the Holy Spirit. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. He comes in and takes residence in our life, he helps us lead the life that God has called us to. So to walk in the Spirit or uh, 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 to, to keep in step with the Spirit is a way of talking about living our day-to-day -day lives depending on the Spirit of God who lives in us. So that's the Spirit. What do we mean by the flesh? Well, when Paul says the flesh, he's not talking about the human body. Right? The human body is, is neutral. It can be used to glorify God or it can be used to sin. The human body is not sinful in and of itself. The body is neutral. So rather, the, when Paul is talking about the flesh, Paul is speaking spiritually. He's talking about what we can do without God. He's talking about sin. He's talking about obeying the law apart from God. The flesh is that which I do in my own power, in my own strength, without God, which uses, usually causes me to sin. I talked about this this last week. I have some slides this week that will maybe help uh, any uh, even more. If we can jump to the to the first slide. Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm still here. So sometimes we, we can think that the Christian life is the balance of these two extremes, legalism on the left and license on the right. And we said legalism is when we try to get, to God, get God to accept us in our own power, by our own works, by our own performance. Let's go to the next slide. Right, so one extreme is to, 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 to lean towards that legalist side, right? To, to obey the law, but only in my power. 
Legalism is all about following the rules in our own power. It's this idea of if I obey God, he will accept me. This was the problem with Jesus when he was on the earth, right? Or not the problem with Jesus. This was the problem with the Pharisees when Jesus was on earth. So the legalist doesn't understand grace because he doesn't think he needs to be saved. So that's one extreme. The other extreme on the next slide is license or license to sin. This is this idea of cheap grace that we talked about, that since I'm not under the law anymore, then God will forgive me so I can sin as much as I want. It doesn't matter. So we have these two extremes, legalism and license. Or as we said last week, we can have these two extremes of trying not to be too good, like the Pharisees, and trying not to be too bad. And we can think that the Christian life is trying to balance these two things. Look at the next slide, right? So, so we can think it's, okay, I don't want to be too good. I don't want to be a legalist. I don't want to be too bad. I don't want to fall into license. And when I was younger, this is what I thought the Christian life was. I was trying to balance these two extremes. Don't be too bad and don't be a Pharisee. Maybe this is how you're trying to live right now. But we know from the New Testament that the Christian life isn't about holding these two things in tension. Next slide. Right? The Christian life isn't about trying not to be too bad and not to be too good. As we just read in Galatians 5, the Christian life is about the battle between the Holy Spirit and the flesh. Let's look at the next slide. Right? So notice the arrow over here is, is pointing forward. So it's, it's not a matter of being stuck in the middle and trying to hold this tension between the spirit and the flesh. Rather, we walk forward in the spirit and we leave the flesh behind. And look at me at the last slide to, to make even more sense of this. We see that license and legalism are rather manifestations of the flesh. So the true battle is walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. So the next question is, what does that look like? How do I know if I'm walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh? There is this battle. So how do I know who's winning? Well, I'm glad you asked. Paul says this is what it looks like to walk in the flesh. Verse 21 or verse 19. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says it's easy to see the works of the flesh in a person's life. They are evident they show right people can say anything people can make themselves sound good with their words but paul says the evidence is in our behaviors now there's a lot of behaviors listed in these three verses some people put these works in the fl of the flesh into three categories so sexual works of the flesh superstitious works of the flesh and social works of the flesh in terms of sexual works of the flesh, the list here begins with sexual immorality. But also in the list we see impurity, sensuality, and orgies. So sexual immorality in the Bible refers to any sexual activity outside of the husband and wife relationship. Jesus said in Matthew 19, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is what God said back in the garden, this is God's design for marriage, his design for sex. So sex is not a bad thing. Sex is a great thing. God created sex. God invented sex. God designed sex. But God always meant for it to be experienced with joy in the covenant marriage relationship. So we see here there's a way to walk in the spirit in regard to sexuality and there's a way to walk in the flesh in regard to sexuality. So when it comes to sexuality in your life, let me ask you, who is winning right now? The spirit or the flesh? 
You know, today, are you engaged in sexual activity outside of marriage? Are you regularly looking at pornography? Are you coveting another man's wife or are you coveting another man's, uh, another wife's husband? Walking in the spirit means honoring God with your body and with your thoughts. That's where the blessing is. Don't expect to be blessed if you're using your body as an instrument for the flesh. The second category of sins here we see are superstitious works of the flesh, say. So this includes idolatry, sorcery, or witchcraft. Idolatry is making something or someone else uh, ultimate and making God number two, number three, number four, and so on. It's worshiping something else or worshiping someone else other than God. So this could be material possessions. It could be devoting all of your time to something other than God. It's making something else, number one, and God, number two. But we know from the Bible that we are to have no idols before the Lord our God, right? And this is more uh, uh, evidence we see of someone controlled by the flesh and not by the spirit. So walking in the spirit means God is number one in your life. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. So who is your master? Are you chasing after the Lord or are you chasing after power, money, possessions, control, approval, or security? Those things aren't necessarily bad. Those things can be good. The problem is when those idols become number one in our life. You know, the lie about idols is that we think they will satisfy us. The lie about idols is if I only had this, then I would be happy and satisfied. But the truth is they can't. Only God can satisfy your soul. This last group of, of works of the flesh we see are the category of social sins, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness. Almost all of these works of the flesh involve our relationships to other people. So what Paul seems to be saying here is that a person who is living according to the flesh seems to have nonstop drama in the relationships of their life. That there are constant quarrels, there are constant arguments, anger is there, jealousy is, is there. Now, of course, there's going to be some times when we're angry, some times when we're jealous, and when that happens, we, we repent. But th with this list, it seems like this person leaves a trail of relationship damage. There seems to be nonstop drama. And Paul says this isn't from the spirit. This isn't from God. It's from the flesh. So if you've ever been in a boat or if you've ever been behind a boat, you can see what they call its wake. The wake is the pattern of waves that go behind the boat as it's going. So when a boat goes by, you can see its wake for a long time, even sometimes when the boat is out of sight. So the boat might be gone, but you can still see its effect in the water. So let me ask you, when it comes to relationships in your life, what is the wake that you are leaving behind you? What is the effect that you leave? Is it a pattern of peace and health, or is it a pattern of drama and destruction? Do you bring people together, or do you divide people? Do you bring people apart? Now, the problem with many times with the people who leave behind this wake of drama is that either they don't realize they do this or they blame their behavior on someone else. But let me ask you this. Let me give you this scenario. Let's imagine that this man goes to a nice and respected restaurant that is full of customers. Everybody's eating. Everybody's enjoying and this man orders a fish. So they bring him the fish. He takes a bite of the fish and he says, oh, this fish is disgusting. He sends it back and says, okay, give me some chicken. They bring him the chicken. He takes a bite and says, this chicken is awful. He sends it back 
asks for a sandwich. The sandwich comes, he eats, a, the, eats the sandwich, says, worst sandwich ever. Give me a pizza. He, they give him the pizza. He hates the pizza, right? You get the point. Now, what is more likely? Is it more likely that the problem is with the restaurant? Or is it more likely that there is a problem with the man? Maybe the restaurant is bad, even though there's other people there enjoying their meals. But it's more likely that the problem is with the man. And even if you put him in a different restaurant, <laughs> he's going to find something wrong with the food there too. Paul says the works of the flesh are evident. They show there are patterns there. Even if we don't want to see them, they are there. They can be seen in our relationships with sexuality. They can be seen in our relationship to material things. And they can be seen in our relationships with other people. Paul even gives us this strong warning in verse 21. He warns them and he warns us that those people who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the verb he uses here in the Greek implies that these are people who have made a practice out of doing these sins. In other words, it's become the prevailing pattern in their life. It's simply normal behavior for them at this point. So we know a believer cannot lose their salvation. But for these people in verse 21, their behavior, their pattern of sin in their lives show that they were never actually the children of God. Maybe they had a spiritual experience one time, but their lives show that they never fully understood and believe the gospel. As you think about Paul's list here this morning, let me ask you as anything on this list become a pattern in your life? Is the Holy Spirit putting one of these things on your heart this morning, right? The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, Paul says. Verse 17 says they, they, they keep you from doing the things that you want to do. They stop you from being the person that you want to be. So that's the flesh list. That's, a, that's the bad list. What about the spirit list? What is the evidence that we are walking by the Spirit of God. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such, there is no law. Paul gives us what we call the fruits of the Spirit. The evidence of what it looks like to walk and follow the Holy Spirit. To resist temptation and to submit to God. And how beautiful and how calming is this list. It's so much nicer to read this list than the other list, right? The words on this list are so peaceful and, and calming when you hear them. And it's a reminder that walking by the Spirit is not just about being on defense against works of the flesh. Life in the Spirit is about being for something. It's God producing something good within you. And notice that this fruit is within us. You know, when we think of, let's say, great Christians from the past, typically we think about people who've done amazing things for the Lord, people who have started many churches, people who have led many people to Christ, people who see their prayers answered. Typically, when we think of great Christians, let's say, we think of these kinds of results. But those kind of results are not what's on this list. When you read this list, it's not about results or ministry effectiveness. It's about godly character. It's about what's on the inside. It's about what God is doing in you by following the Holy Spirit's leading and disregarding the flesh. So it's interesting here that Paul talks about the pattern of sin as works of the flesh. But when he talks about life in the spirit, he talks about fruit. One author says, when you think about works, you think about effort and labor and strain and toil. But when you think about fruit, you think about beauty, quietness, and the unfolding of life. This is about God working inside of you to become more like Jesus Christ. The point of spiritual growth is not to grow for the sake of growing. It's to become more like him. At the same time, we know that maturity and growth takes 
time. This is why Paul uses this metaphor of fruit when he talks about spirituality. You can't microwave fruit. Fruit is not instant. Fruit takes time to grow and mature. And the same is true with our spiritual lives. You know, when I was 18 years old when I became a believer, but by God's grace, I'm a lot more mature today than I was at 18. You can just talk to my parents and talk to my friends back then. Fruit takes time to grow. And e but even though it takes time to grow and time to mature, we know that it's always growing, right? You need to wait and, uh, uh, to eat a peach until it's fully mature. But even when it's not mature, it's still growing. And so it is with our spiritual growth. We don't become mature overnight, but by seeking to continue to grow, we become more mature over time. As I always say, good character is built by making thousands of good decisions, small decisions, consistently over time. You know, going back to the topic of the Holy Spirit, how I said, you know, sometimes we can characterize him as, as the old crazy uncle. You know, we know from 1 Corinthians that the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts to benefit the church. And this is great. This is how we as a church work and thrive. But sometimes as Christians, we put the, the spiritual gifts over this fruit. We put the gifts over the fruits of the Spirit. So, for example, dynamic preaching might be seen as more valuable to the, to, to the church than patience, right? So some people might uh, elevate the gift of preaching over the fruit of patience. But the Bible teaches us the opposite. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through, 1 through 3. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Paul says you can have the best gifts in the world. You can have the most talent in the world. But if you don't have love, you have nothing. Right? The world might elevate a gift over a fruit. But we see here that a gift without the fruit is nothing. You know, over the years, I've come to value the, the fruit of the Spirit more than any talent or more than any gift that someone has. Because if you have someone who is faithful who is kind, who is patient, who is peaceful, a person that brings people together. It doesn't matter how much talent that person has. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much gifting that person has. You can do anything with that person. You can put that person in any situation, and they're going to thrive. So that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's the result of following Jesus and walking in the Spirit. But we haven't necessarily answered the question yet of, what does walking in the Spirit look like? We see what it looks like to walk according to the flesh. We've seen the evidence of walking in the Spirit. But how do we actually walk in the Spirit? Verses 24 through 26, our last verses for today. It says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying, envying them one another. So first, in, in verse 24, Paul reminds the church that those who follow Jesus have crucified the flesh, just as Christ was crucified on the cross. So we've been saying this a lot the past two weeks. In Jesus, you are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You've been born again. You're no longer a slave to fear, to sin, or from trying to keep the law in your own power. You have been set free. We talked about this a lot last week. You become who you already are in Christ. But we know that it can be easy to go back to the old ways, to old sins, to old habits. So Paul is reminding them again of their reality in Christ. You're no longer that person who you were before following Jesus. The old nature is dead and gone. You're a new creation. Feed the new man, kill the old man, as we said. 
In verse 25, he says, then it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Or maybe your translation says, follow the Spirit's leading. You know, and this verse reminds me of dancing. So not necessarily modern dancing, you know, in which there's a lot of, you know, jumping around, not like this. But it reminds me of this kind of formal dancing, maybe you see at a very, you know, formal wedding in which, you know, they're, they're kind of standing upright. Typically, the man is, is, is leading the woman, you know, in, in, in some kind of steps of the dance. And the way it works is the, the band typically makes a dance move and the woman follows. And when these, when these two people, when this couple, when they are in sync, the dance looks beautiful. He moves and she moves in step with him. It just flows gracefully. But when the couple is not in sync, it can look like a mess, right? Especially when both people are trying to lead. It just doesn't work. It's best when one person leads and the other person follows. And so it is with the Spirit. The Spirit speaks to us through God's Word. We read God's Word. We can understand what God wants from us. So, for example, let's say I, I read the Bible and I, and I see that God commands me to honor my parents. And the Holy Spirit convicts me and, and shows me, you know what, I need to honor my, my parents more. So the Holy Spirit has made his move, let's say. The Holy Spirit is leading the dance. The question is, is will I stay in step with him? Will I follow him as he moves? Will I then take that step and actually honor my parents more? But let me give you another example. Let's say there's an unresolved situation at your work or, or maybe with your school. So you pray about it. You pray for God to bring an answer. You pray for, for a resolution, but the resolution isn't coming. So you're waiting. And after some time, it becomes clear that the Spirit is trying to teach you to trust and have faith. So again, the Holy Spirit has made his move. He's leading. The question is, will you move with him? Will you keep in step with him? Will you choose faith over fear in that moment? It's like a dance. And we know from God's word that the Holy Spirit always wants to dance, let's say. The Holy Spirit is always trying to get us to move closer to God. The Holy Spirit is calling us to move, but we're to be in step with him. The Holy Spirit always wants to dance. So maybe he is like that uncle at the wedding. No, I'm just kidding. So on the one hand, going back to the beginning, the Christian life is incredibly simple. It's not complicated. The Christian life can be lived by an educated and brilliant 55-year-old doctor. But the Christian life can also be lived by a 10-year-old girl who just decided to follow Jesus. Jesus, of course, said his yoke, his teaching, is easy. His burden is light. So on the one hand, the Christian life is simple. At the same time, we know that the Christian life can be difficult. Jesus told us there would be persecution. Jesus told us there would be trouble. Jesus told us that we must deny ourselves. We still live in a sinful world. There are still temptations to sin. There are always temptations to gratify the flesh, to not walk in step with the Spirit. The Christian life is simple, but that doesn't mean it's easy. But despite that, Paul says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So let me ask you this morning, how is your walk? But let me ask it another way. How are your dance moves right now? Are you stuck on a particular move right now? Has the Spirit made a move, but you haven't followed him yet? Has he shown you something that he wants you to do, or has he shown you something that he wants you not to do, but instead of following his move, instead of keeping in step with the Spirit, you're, you're frozen 
you're stuck. Or maybe this morning you realize that you're trying to lead the dance of your life right now. You're trying to take control. You're trying to implement your moves, your plan, and your way. As I said, whenever both people try to lead a dance, it simply doesn't work. And the same is true with our lives. After all, do you really think you know better than the Lord and how to live your life? If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Holy Spirit has made his move. It's your turn to follow his lead. The question is, what will you do? I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward and, and lead us in a song of response to God's word. And in a moment, we're going to have a time of, of invitation. You know, this morning, if God is, is dealing with you, if he's working on your heart, we want to help you. We want to pray for you. And this is an opportunity to respond to what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. You know, maybe this morning you've been convicted that you've been living your life according to the flesh and not according to the Spirit. This morning, if God is, is moving you to, to turn from your sins, to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you to come forward. We would love to pray with you. We would love to welcome you into the family of God. Or maybe, like I said at the end, you're realizing this morning that you're a bit stuck in the dance. The Holy Spirit has made his move. He has shown you where he wants you to go. But maybe you're hesitating. Maybe you're frozen. Maybe you are stuck. We would love to pray with you, too, and encourage you. Or maybe it's something else on your heart this morning. However God is leading you, this is a time for you to respond. I'll be up here in the front. Jerry will be here in the front as you come forward. Let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ability to understand uh, how to live a life that pleases you. Father God, we don't want to live a life according to the flesh. We, we don't want to uh, 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 bear fruit of the works of the flesh, God. We want to bear the, the, the spiritual fruit in you. We want to bear the fruit of the spirit. So God, as Paul says here, we recognize it is a battle that we can't do this in our own power, that it's through your spirit that we can walk this life of faith that you call us to. So I pray that we would leave this fleshly life behind and walk according to your spirit, Father. God, for anyone here this morning who maybe realizes that they've never handed you control over their life, that they've never decided to trust you, perhaps they're experiencing the emptiness of a life in the flesh. God, we pray that you would work in their, and move in their hearts, that they would be transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved son. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.